All right. Uh, well, I am lucky enough to um, be here today at PeaceCon together with my good colleague. And we want to welcome everybody online um, to what is a fireside chat, although we don't have the fire, but we are together chatting. And when we were prepping for this session, we talked about sitting around um, in a tea cafe, having this kind of conversation. So we're looking forward to doing that and really want to make it an interactive conversation um, to talk about the challenges of cross-border conflicts and how what we can do to, to strengthen our response to them. So my name is BZ Dallas and I'm with DT Global and I am joined today by my colleague Errol Yagake and uh, from Center for Strategic and International Studies and Pia Wenick from Global Communities. And so we want to take some time to talk about sort of what are highly complex um, cross-border conflicts and the, and the different global issues we're seeing with regard to climate change, illicit trafficking, and scarce resources. Donor funding and the delivery of humanitarian and development assistance is still largely directed at individual countries rather than towards groups uh, that are often straddling these, these conflicting borders. Many borders are the results of colonial legacies that are arbitrarily divided up, um, communities often from the same ethnic groups, and who continue to struggle with these artificial boundaries today. Historical grievances, poor governance, violent extremism, food insecurity are among the several factors that exacerbate these cross-border conflicts. Uh, I'm just back from Jeddah, actually, where we were um, taking out our, our team from Sudan. And sadly, we're watching this play out in real time. While initially framed as a power struggle between two generals, we're really watching um, the nature of the conflict be inherently geopolitical and it's resulting in a lot of conflict spillover, um, which is fluid and multidimensional. So we're seeing armed actors come into Sudan supporting the different forces. And we're also seeing the civilians flee into other countries, Egypt, Chad, um, Ethiopia, South Sudan. Um, and then, unfortunately, yet again, witnessing the backsliding of uh, the development gains that the donor community has put into Sudan for so many years, um, and they are tested once again to, um, to see how they, we might be able to support the Sudanese people to realize a feeling led must, which right now seems to be very far-fetched, um, something that we'll be continuing to struggle with. Today, we want to shine a light on some of the broader challenges we've observed in cross-border conflicts and discuss uh, how the international community needs to adapt in terms of programming policies, funding mechanisms, and coordination. So while the three of us are going to start out by offering up some of our observations, both from a programming and policy perspective, uh, in East Africa, West Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe, we know there's a tremendous amount of expertise uh, that's with us online here, um, and many who have been serving in other geographies. So we welcome the conversation um, with that. We're eager to have you join by the chat function that we have here. My colleague, Andrea Wagner, is here, um, who will be monitoring the chat. So please feel free to let us know what's on your mind, put in questions, join the conversation. This really is meant to be an interactive conversation with in front of our fireside, which is apparently so. <laughs> can we add on the out there? Can we add a fireplace? Thank you. Surely, especially if it's cold in the still can it actually helps. Um, and anyway, back to the, the conversation at hand. So I'm gonna kick it off by talking about a lot of the challenges I've seen in East Africa and in the Horn and the common trends we're seeing in terms of exacerbating existing ethnic or economic conflicts. Um, include rogue security actors, uh, drought-induced food insecurity resulting in mass displacement, uh, disputed trade routes, and violent extremism. So in, um, if you could pop up the slide, actually. In the Mandera Triangle along the Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya borders, um, ill-equipped and poorly trained security actors, including both police and military, who are intended to protect the civilians there, um, instead prey upon them and or are entirely absent, uh, enabling Al-Shabaab's control over the borderland regions. Security actors stationed along the border in remote areas of the Mandera Triangle 
are often not of the same clan and certainly don't speak the, the local languages. They're creating a real disconnect uh, and communication challenges, which often breeds suspicion. So locals are quickly associated with being from Al-Shabaab by the security forces and security actors themselves are receiving bribes to look the other way when crimes are committed or violence is committed. Further fueling the cross-border conflicts uh, in those areas, the regular trafficking of weapons and goods, narcotics, um, which is supporting the complex economy across those borders. Adding fuel to the fire uh, is the crippling drought that is creating the famine conditions resulting in mass displacement um, with the largest percentages of population moving from Somalia into Kenya and Ethiopia, creating a strain on already weakened resources um, and depleting basic services and governments are ill-equipped to respond, especially in those very remote areas. Other trends in the Horn include competition over trade corridors between neighboring states, which when restricted are often closed, exacerbate conflict between the communities that need to access the cross-border markets to survive. Cross-border trade negotiations, negotiations between legitimate and illegitimate actors creates that you know, eh, excuse me, enabling environment for economic winners and losers. Taking a community-centered approach we have found to be the most useful um, in terms of looking at the relationship between formal and informal actors, as well as the inter and intra-clan dynamics that are key to managing violence across borders in the Madeira Triangle. Next slide, please. So in the remote Karamoja region crossing the borders of Kenya and Uganda, a major destabilizing factor there we've noticed is the conflict between communities over natural resources, water and grazing land, resulting in frequent armed clashes and cattle rustling. Both the Kenya and Uganda governments are struggling to disarm the local militias and develop policies that effectively govern the migration routes through this quarter. Furthermore, Karamoja has extensive mineral wealth that's left communities exposed to the exploitation by private investors who are eager to exploit the rich resources in that region. International organizations have supported community institutions at the local level to facilitate dialogue between ethnic groups to reach agreements on resource sharing and establish policies that govern land tenure and access. However, a lot more work needs to be done in these areas and policies that can effectively govern mineral extraction in the Karamoja region need to be established. Next slide. Similarly, along the Sudan and South Sudan border of Northern uh, Bar Ghazal, which you know Errol knows well, um, so feel free to chime in. Uh, the semi-nomadic Nisaria from Sudan cross over the Kaluid border with their cattle in search of water and, and pasture land. This seasonal cattle migration results in conflict with the Dinka, where their crops are often trampled and resources further depleted. While the Misseria and Dinka have a long history of peacefully interacting and managing conflict, increasing access to weapons combined with political manipulation have stirred up unresolved grievances between the two. We found in our, in our work that if we bring leaders of both communities together across the border um, into, in, around the disputed issues, um, we can bring them to a common understanding what those issues actually are, and together they can jointly decide on the solutions that are most effective uh, in terms of managing the conflict. In Northern Bar Nizal, peace committees have also been set up uh, so that if conflict arises, committees could immediately go to the site of the conflict, diffuse it, and or elevate it to uh, community leaders to manage. Efforts by implementing partners to mitigate cross-border conflict uh, also include establishing early warning networks, some of them comprised actually by women's groups, developing cross-border peace markets, rehabilitating water points, facilitating cross-border social exchanges, and supporting civil society groups that can come together and negotiate and advocate for policies to mitigate cross-border clashes. Next slide. One aspect of the cross-border conflict in the uh, eastern equatorial state of South Sudan are the regular ambushes along the main roads leading to and from Uganda and Kenya, resulting in loss of life and, and goods. Although these routes act as a main route for movements of goods and people, insecurity along the roads hamper their use. 
Implementing partners have made efforts to work with communities in and around where the regular ambushes are taking place to try and decrease insecurity and facilitate the ability of the communities to access these markets, as well as the basic services such as health clinics um, and schools by the road, which are the clear and tangible benefits that that peace brings. Sadly, however, we're noticing the attacks along the roads are, are beginning to rise again in eastern Equatoria. But I'm going to stop there, uh, and I'm eager to hear from Pia about her experiences in the Middle East and Eastern Europe and what solutions you have along the way. Awesome. Thanks, PZ. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with both of you today on this illustrious panel. And may the fourth be with you. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm joining here today as the Senior Vice President for Global Programs at Global Communities uh, to provide some reflections through the lens of an implementing partner coming from a non-governmental, not-for-profit space. Global Communities delivers essential solutions to complex challenges from the intersection of humanitarian assistance, sustainable development, and financial inclusion. Working in more than 25 countries worldwide, including the U.S., in today's complex world, fragile and stable contexts are not always clearly defined, and we know that communities move back and forth from crisis to resilience. Global Communities designs flexible programs based on decades of experience across humanitarian assistance, sustainable development, and financial inclusion to meet real-world needs where and when they arise. And I'll be touching on two contexts today relevant to our discussion as we address the complexities of implementing varied programming in contested areas, including cross-border conflict environments. One could argue that in any major humanitarian crisis today, the legacy of colonial borders and sometimes impenetrable international institutions and donor resources are a direct impediment to holistic, comprehensive assistance to meet the basic needs of affected groups. Today, I'll focus on our work in Syria and Turkey, as well as our work inside Ukraine, which predates the Russian invasion. So in Syria, why this is very much for anyone listening, and I imagine a crisis we know well, sadly. Uh, we are currently implementing five projects valued at more than $63 million across Northeast and Northwest Syria, spanning assistance for life-saving humanitarian activities in Northwest and Northeast, looking at shelter repair and renovation in Northwest, a complement of winterization programs and providing cash to families to support winter needs, as well as a large-scale agricultural value chain activity, supporting livelihoods, distributing fodder and seeds, and working with veterinary services to provide and vaccinate thousands of livestock. We've been working in Syria since the beginning of the crisis and both the extensive development assistance as well as the activities needed for life-saving work continue even now. This is a substantial portfolio, I would say, and reflects the ongoing investment that the international community has made to respond to the needs inside Syria for the past decade. Funding levels, however, are substantially declining and donor commitments and pledges are coming in at a fraction of what was actually needed, even in the midst of the dealingness for this amount of time. Global Communities works in areas that are not controlled by the government, and while humanitarian needs are consistent cross-line, the ability of many organizations to work cross-line is limited uh, by safety and security concerns and by the extensive additional pressure and scrutiny by donors when working in government-held areas and in sanctioned areas. As we know. The quote-unquote borderlands, so to speak, internally within Syria are complex and contested spaces and are volatile to consistently try to work in, even with communities that are moving across the different lines. Indeed, working in and through Damascus continues to present difficulties for many international initiatives concerned about neutrality and independence. As many of you know, in January 2023, the UN Security Council voted to continue the resolution authorizing cross border assistance in Syria, UNFCR C64 group, for additional for an additional six months through July of 2023. While non renewal of the resolution would not directly impact our and most INGOs' direct ability to work with Syria, it would prohibit UN agencies from delivering assistance into Syria, which of course would exasperate widespread humanitarian needs, particularly in the food sector. I bring this up to note that, thankfully and helpfully, the UN Security Council and the resolution is what galvanizes press and advocacy, which are absolutely important when it comes to the funding resources that are required. However, it's worth noting that commercial traffic cross border into Syria, including from Turkey, continues. The economies of the area are fully interrelated, as they always have been for generations, and do continue even in the midst of the conflict. Commercial actors have built resilience demanded by economic pressures. Many find ways to work through the system that is constantly evolving. And this agile and nimble response to changing conditions is in contrast, oftentimes. 
uh, to the response from the broader donor community when substantial aid flows, where substantial aid flows typically come from, which is often relatively slow to evolve and to modify their approaches when conditions change overnight, as they did in the February earthquake. Climate change adds additional challenges, as we know, the intense winters that we've seen, water scarcity is another issue, and create more drivers for conflict with scarce resources at a time when conditions are not improving, and the focus does remain on life-saving assistance, which is important, but this does not help to build the capacity in a sustained manner of local organizations to raise funds and step into the gap where large-scale international resources and NGOs have needed to step back in certain cases given funding. Shifting gears a bit to talk about the earthquake. Um, as we all know, but just to remind us, February 6, 2023, magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck southeasterly near the city of Gaziantep, which is actually where Global Communities has its base of operations and a number of other NGOs. The earthquake caused large scale damage throughout southeast Turkey and northwest Syria. Like many, <clears throat> they stepped in quickly with emergency stipends for our staff. Psychosocial support was our focus, housing relocation for those that needed the new team. But we did have to tap into internal resources of the organization, our own unrestricted funds, to rapidly support staff. And given the structure of our funding mechanisms not being exactly nimble, um, even in the midst of a complex uh, scenario. That said, we also rapidly saw that our donors did end up offering assistance, and they were very quick to say yes, even in the terms of staff care, other types of assistance, even in our, for our staff both based inside Turkey as well as those. Uh, based inside Syria, that they were able to modify their approach so it is possible to have that, that flexibility and that fluidity when it comes to crises. Another example I could have brought into this discussion, but we'll say for another time, is the similar way that uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development modified their response to the Ebola crisis, mm -hmm. which we had extensive experience in when pressures are hard and um, the heat that gets turned on, there is the feasibility to actually make some changes. And I think we need to continue with that motivated and inspirational and innovation kind of approach. There are two types of, um, sort of two types, we would call them, of local actors as well in, in the Turkish context. Um, Turkish uh, uh, community support organizations and cross-border NGOs that work more so in, the, in Syria, uh, with many of local organizations focusing on life-saving work. Um, of course, life-saving work needs to happen, but that continued and sustained focus on early recovery and resilience uh, types of activities and preparedness, there isn't as much funding or resources there, which is, I think, a major gap. They're woefully underfunded as well. There have been major delays in terms of resources coming in into the Turkish context, um, and we know that the coordination mechanisms, just by the nature of how the funding flows, uh, for more of an institutionalized approach within Syria that we know well from working there for many years, as compared to more of a, a, a national-led effort with the government of Turkey. They're basically complementary types of systems, but don't necessarily complement one another in terms of the resources that are there, which um, shows a stark difference then in the aid flows and the mechanisms um, in terms of actually being able to uh, distribute aid. Consistent and predictable funding to local organizations truly is that unfulfilled dream <laughs> with bureaucratic standards that are exceedingly difficult and expensive for local entities to meet. And often the same larger local NGOs are tapped by many and risk being overloaded with the risk of rapid expansion without the commensurate resources to build internal systems. That's the not sexy stuff <laughs> in terms of actually building your infrastructure, your budget processes, your administrative um, type of effort when the, the focus is more so on showing performance from the aid money that goes in. And there's rarely ever money for that. Not Rarely, sexy stuff. if ever. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The non sexy stuff. But I think that really that bolstering of that type of um, that effort needs to be a part of the localization um, discussion buzzword that is currently in play as well. There are ongoing steps in the right path, including new and pooled resources, pooled funds um, as well, which are increasing. Uh, but more needs to be done to soften the journey uh, for local organizations to access that kind of sustained funding. I'll briefly touch on Ukraine as well to, to round out our examples. Um, currently, we're implementing four projects with a total project value of more than 123 million. Uh, we've been working in uh, Ukraine since 2016, working with more than 100 communities with 80 plus partners, um, and also working in a community led emergency action and response program um, as a result of the, the conflict that's intensified. The foundation of our work and the portfolio there has been in a decentralization type of effort, uh, trying to build efficiencies with this a broad reach. Um, in 10 oblasts um, or regions of Ukraine out of a total of 24. So millions of people have been able to benefit from this work. And we're working very much at the local governance level, strengthening existing structures to ensure that they can provide life-saving assistance. And when the war intensified, we were able to leverage this access and relationships with these communities to be able to develop a, a much more wide-scale humanitarian response. 
painting a picture like it's all roses, but those things are always complicated and difficult yeah. to actually do, even when you have an infrastructure in place, which is worth noting. It's complicated, it takes more study, it takes more analysis, more of an understanding of what we actually can do well, even in the midst of those that are being uh, directly impacted by the crisis. The international response inside Ukraine has been enormous in scale and investment. I mean, just absolutely enormous. But the conditions remain exceedingly complicated in critically affected areas. And one cannot assume that these massive funding inflows will continue. And of course, the continued virus of Russian attacks continues to negatively impact uh, people's lives. I wanted to reference just a very brief example as well, just with the, um, even as we know very well that there are major refugee influxes that are going to happen post crisis. Um, when I visited Poland, even just a few weeks after the crisis, even knowing what we do now in terms of the structures that are needed, it was um, interesting to me to see that our our international institutions were not really as present in a way that I would have hoped that they, they would be at that front end. And I think we still have a lot more work to be done to be able to build out those systems um, and for there to be more of an understanding of where those that are most effective have the ability to actually access resources when they need them. To understanding that the long-term impacts of the now more than 8.2 million Ukrainian displaced across Europe is going to have another further destabilizing um, effort. So these examples shine a light on how our international system of aid funding is due for an update <laughs> in order to be fit to purpose mm -hmm. uh, to support grassroots local organizations at scale um, and just given the modifying changes that we're actually seeing um, in the way that we respond. Sustained, ongoing, relatively easily accessible and flexible funding is key in a multi-year kind of dynamic. And understanding that compliance is exceedingly important. Um, there needs to be an understanding and a glide path for local organizations like we've talked about who lack the INGO um, or the broad contractor compliance infrastructure to be able to access this large scale foreign funding that is available. And I think that has been pledged, but oftentimes it's difficult to tap into. And we also require ongoing investment in the training and skills development and nuance on minimum humanitarian standards on anti corruption practices and support for local coordination bodies in addition to and in coordination with you and Asha as well. Just to play the next ways. So I'll stop there. And thanks very much for the opportunity to talk through a number of these examples and the many limitations facing the sector. And I'll hand over the owl. The owl is moving. The owl. <laughs> Yeah, right. we're moving. I think he was looking at it. Is that for so. sound reasons? Yeah. A little we're sound. Have some yeah. static. Please bear with us for a minute while we test this again. And if this does not work before you speak, um, Errol, you're yeah. gonna be looking at my laptop. Yeah, no, it's fine. Let's, let's give it a shot. Um, those on the line, could you actually? Um, I'm, I'm a little loud. So for those on, on okay. online, um, hopefully you can hear me. Thumbs up. Yeah, just drop in the, the chat. chat. Let us know. Okay. Does it sound less staticky? Yeah. Is it clearer on your end? Uh, we saw Darren and oh, no. we're just drop in the chat. We're appreciative of your patience with us. It's actually this is my fault because um, <laughs> happens well, well, the fact that we're in this classroom at Trinity Washington University and not okay, yeah, in our home fault. offices. Yeah. Yeah. All okay. your fault. Okay. So are, it's totally my fault. Use your rich sonorous baritone. Yeah. Yes, sonorous. rich sonorous baritone. Um, it's, uh, I, I was actually in choir. My mother is a music teacher, retired, um, and so I actually know what those words mean. Um, it's funny. I, I want to pick up actually on where you left off on the on the funding. I have some things that I will talk about vis-a-vis -vis borders, but I think this flexible funding thing. I, I was um, I was talking to. Uh, 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 let me, how do I say this in vague terms, uh, a representative of a major philanthropic organization. And they were basically saying like what, you know, I, I don't implement things in the field like y'all do. Uh, I did in the past, but I don't anymore. And so I don't really have a skin in the game in terms of topics and regions and things. So we were having a, a brainstorm about different areas and, and, and projects. And I, I sort of stopped at one point because I've heard this flexible funding, inflation makes everything more expensive. So your budgets, by the time, you know, especially for development funding, you put it in two years ago and now it's totally obsolete. And even in humanitarian funding, weeks and months can make a difference. And so I was talking to this philanthropic person and, and they were saying, you know, what types of things would you prioritize or what, you know, geographically, topically? And I said, I think that's the wrong question. I think it's, how do you complement the existing system? And here is what is broken in the existing system. And I would argue that a lot of our 
US government friends probably realize that this is a challenge. There are systematic reasons why even those who are more reform minded can't mm -hmm. do those reforms. And so I it made me think like, is there a role for for philanthropy and other sort of non-government donors to like global communities reaching into your pocket and using your unrestricted funds to top up? God bless you. There's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I was, I was thinking about that. I'll just make a, a small point on that. Well, I mean, we all know this, but it has to be said over and over again, which is the amount of earmarked funds restrains everything. So if we have to operate within the frame of earmarked funds, we then have to be creative with those earmarked funds. So how can PEPFAR funds address cross-border conflicts? What do we need to think about doing, especially when some of these issues like education where we've got a heavy earmark or PEPFAR or some of these other issues, how can we be creative with those funds to address some of the conflict drivers, which often inherently are access to basic services and those kinds of things. So I think it's a matter of figuring out how to make the funds flexible, figuring out how to then leverage the earmarks to get, because everybody's going to have their pet project and everybody's going to have their pet issue and their pet geographic region. But I think the sectors need to start to become so intertwined um, that we can be working together. And it's not such a like humanitarian does this, development does this, peace building does this, but it's but it's that that nexus, which I, I don't like that term, but it is in fact that nexus. But I do think there's a role for the private sector 100 percent and for the philanthropic sector. Yeah, I mean, you just hit on the raison d'etre of the nexus, right? Right. Like, you know, we've got these silos, and and the way to break them down is theoretically this magic word nexus, which I also don't particularly like. But um, we'll come up with a new one at the end of this. I right. I think okay. yeah, challenge accepted. <laughs> I wanted to talk about two two particular issues as they relate to borders, and um, and then use an example from, from each. And just before I launch into that, I think the point that both of you made about the sort of colonial legacy, um, I'm going to be talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, the two examples that I'm going to be using, and, and it's sort of the, not the only, but the quintessential um, sort of colonial legacy uh, phenomenon as it exists in Africa vis-a-vis -vis borders. And, and I think that the topics that I'm going to talk about are not unique to um, border areas and cross-border conflicts, but they are particularly acute in those areas. Uh, and that's sort of why I chose them. The other reason that I chose them is because I was recently in both of these places doing research. And so maybe I have slightly greater than zero things to say about them. Um, I think the first thing to say before I even launch into those two places and two topics is that borders are, are really fluid in a lot of places. We're, we're sort of having this discussion a day after President Biden sent 1,500 troops to the southern border, mm -hmm. right? And, and so when we think about borders, a lot of us think about these, um, you know, how high is the wall going to be and, you know, fences and, and sort of hard borders. And in a lot of these places, that's not the case. You, you talked about Somalia and, and the Horn of Africa. When I was living in the Somali region of Ethiopia, that my Somali friends actually had much more of a connection mm -hmm. to friends in Mogadishu than they did to friends in Addis, culturally, ethnically, linguistically, culinarily. Mm -hmm. uh, God, I missed the food there. Um, but they they ended up, I mean, we, we were doing drought relief when I uh, was with the ar artist formerly known as CHF International um, out in uh, that's now known as global communities for those that, that don't know that bad joke. Um, I was doing drought relief in, in 2011 out there and there were uh, th there were certain projects that we were doing, um, finding, you know, digging wells and, and, and shallow wells and, and water catchment areas and things that were, let's just say I would go to them and all of a sudden I would get cell service and I'd say, why am I getting cell service? Well, sir, there's a Somali cell tower that's right there. What do you mean a Somali cell tower? Oh, Somalia, the government of Somalia, the state of Somalia. I was like, oh, where's our project? Okay, it's on, it's on the Ethiopian side. 
but really where is the Ethiopian side versus the, the Somalia side in those communities that's completely fluid, they don't really even think about it. So I, I think that this conversation is a really critical conversation. I think we should start by acknowledging that it's not always that big of an issue for those communities that live in those areas because they're not having to do that you know, crossing the Rio Grande or a fence or some sort of like physical barrier. A lot of this is just like, oh, that tree, that's Somalia, this tree, that's Ethiopia. Um, which leads me to my first example. And, and the two places that I have chosen to talk about, one, Ghana, I think we've got a, a slide on Ghana. Uh, and then I'll talk about Mozambique in a little bit. Both of these places, the US government cares about in new and interesting ways. Um, if you're tuning into PeaceCon, you probably know that there's something called the Global Fragility Act and that it has resulted in the hardest acronym to say, the SPCPS, the Strategy to Prevent Conflict and Promote Stabilization. Stability. 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 Stability, thank you. Um, <laughs> SP, SPCPS. Uh, say it five times fast. So those two places, coastal West Africa, of which Ghana is one, and Mozambique are two priority areas. Um, and so we're, uh, it's, that's the reason that I was out there. But as I was out there, I, I was thinking about this border issue. And, and so BZ, I was so honored and, and thankful that you asked me to join this because one of the reasons that coastal West Africa was selected, I think, I have no G14 classified information about this, but I, I think that one of the, yeah, I am not sharing secrets. I don't have any. Um, one of the reasons I think that, that Coastal West Africa was selected, and if you read the 10 year strategy chapeau that was made public, it's all about violent extremism spillover. Um, and the, the worry that this sort of Sahel region that has been for years beset by extremism uh, and, and sort of dealing with terrorist incidents uh, one after the other, got complicating factors like in Burkina Faso and you know, Mali kicking out France, and then all of a sudden Wagner is, is there. You know, you've got some weird geopolitical dynamics. The fear is that those spill over into these coastal West Africa places. One country is Guinea. Let's set Guinea aside, focuses on democratic transition after coup, et cetera. But I think for the other ones, um, Cote d'Ivoire and, and Togo and Benin and Ghana, you've you've got, if you're the US together with friends and allies, you you have you have the ability to play defense, or at least that's what you're thinking. Because there are these challenges that exist in the Sahel. We don't want them to be in these coastal West Africa places. And in particular, Ghana, I wrote a piece that I don't remember the exact title, but it was like, we need to be caring about Ghana because everybody's thinking that Ghana is this sort of paragon of stability yeah. and, and economic partner, and they're always going to be there for us and everything. But hopefully that's true. But I came away thinking there are some, there are some challenges that Ghana is facing. One of them is this cross-border issue. Some of them are domestic. But I think that the U.S. government is on to something vis-a-vis -vis this spillover I think they're overemphasizing it personally, um, but I think that there is a play here. One of the really interesting things that I found when I was talking to, to Ghanaians was it, was, it was in the course of a conversation, we were sitting across the table like this and somebody would said, oh yeah, extremists come to Ghana for R&R. &R. <laughs> and I was like, I lived in Iraq, R&R, &R, like rest and relaxation. Like we used to leave Iraq and go to Istanbul or something. Yes, yes, yes. They they come and they hang out in the northern parts of Ghana um, to to restock, to re to take a nap or to you know whatever they're doing and, and to to maybe rearm. I didn't find evidence of that. I wasn't particularly looking for that type of evidence, but um, I think the reality is that that there are some spaces in northern Ghana and northern Togo and northern Benin and, and northeastern Cote d'Ivoire where even if they are not able to launch attacks from there, they feel safe there. Mm -hmm. And that, that I think when we think about borders, we think about these ungoverned spaces that, that again, not unique 
like ungoverned spaces don't only exist in border areas, but I think there are more of them in these places. Um, and I think that the, the fact that there is an international border adds complexity to responding in these places. So if you have uh, Burkina Faso based or Mali based extremists or something like that who are coming into Ghana and doing whatever they're doing in Ghana, maybe they're not there, you know, Ghanaians love to talk about the fact that there hasn't been a terrorist attack in Ghana, but recently, but you know, maybe that's not the goal. The goal is to have this R and R location, this this uh, sort of restocking, and and I think they find in places like northern Ghana and and, and southern Burkina, they're very fluid. People going back and forth, and that ungoverned spaces. Um, element or, or idea is what I wanted to talk about vis-a-vis -vis Mozambique as well. And so in Northern Mozambique, there um, is very little government presence, uh, I think is putting it maybe lightly. Um, there's a town called Pemba, which, you know, politicians will parachute into and they'll give a speech and then they'll, they'll go back to the capital. Outside of Pemba, in, in what is geographically a huge swath of territory, much of which borders places like Rwanda and Tanzania, which is the one I'm going to focus on, you've got essentially no government presence and un, un, really ungoverned spaces. And so the numbers of violent extremists that maybe you're basing in Tanzania, uh, which of course Tanzania doesn't want to talk about, but the number of folks that are that are based in that area, maybe that are coming over into Mozambique and fighting fertile ground, uh, they're finding you know uh, young people that they're able to recruit, not because there's particular extremist ideology, but because there's extreme sort of negligence or or, or uh, there's nothing out there economically speaking, governance speaking, nobody has a voice. So even if I'm a young person in northern Mozambique, maybe I have linguistic ties to these folks who are from uh, southern Tanzania. Uh, may maybe I just am disgruntled or maybe I'm just looking for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the Mozambican government, uh, I, I didn't come away thinking that the solution for this was, um, obviously it's going to be hard, but I didn't come away thinking that this was an insurmountable challenge. And then I think the international community can't help because giving those young people a voice, doing economic activity, sort of generating some economic activity seemed to be what they were looking for. They were finding that voice and economic activity in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they have, again, linguistic and, and other cultural ties to, to maybe some of these extremist groups. But I think that they were looking for something else not necessarily that extremist. And, and again, this is a border area that's pretty fluid. People coming and going. Um, the Mozambican government would like you to think that this is all Tanzanians coming and, and creating wreaking havoc in northern Mozambique. Uh, my sense was, I'm not going to out any of the sources that I talked to, but my sense was that's probably not the case, that there were some people, certainly, and maybe leaders and resources, but a lot of this was sort of a, a domestic northern Mozambique uh, recruitment challenge. Um, but I would hope not an insurmountable challenge. So violent extremism spillover and ungoverned spaces are, are two of the things that I wanted to talk about, really accentuating that, that fluid nature of of border areas and, and, and how that creates more complexity for the DT globals and the global communities of, of the world. It's a bon chance. <laughs> Keep thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. And as a think tank, I, I sort of identify problems and then I'm like, go fix them. So uh, one question I would ask the two of you, and I've pondered this myself, but I don't have a good answer. Um, but one query I have about the coastal West Africa focus that we have now, um, is there something to be said also for the access to the ocean, access mm. to ports, right? So the, the coastal West Africa states, as um, Rob Jenkins was saying yesterday, you know, they, they feel the like violent extremism knocking at their door. They know it's an issue that 
but is is the push down is it to get to the to access to the coast is that at all part of this calculation because you it, it, it allows certainly for greater transport greater access to other but i don't know I feel like that's one of those since the beginning of humanity. Yes, <laughs> right, right. You know, pushing down towards that access to water. I don't know more specifically. I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian here. That's great. Uh, I don't actually think I, that that is certainly a fear. I don't necessarily see that as that big of an issue. I think that there are um, significant enough cultural, linguistic historical differences between, let's just take Ghana, between Northern Ghana and Southern Ghana, um, religious differences, other sorts of like, you know, if you look at a, Ghana is sort of like, you look at Accra and the coastal regions and how developed they are, and then there's a completely different Ghana up north. So you could see how those extremists or other actors were, are finding fertile ground in, in a place like northern Ghana that is a little bit more ungoverned. That's not actually the experience of southern Ghana. So if you're telling me that extremists that are based in Burkina Faso and Mali and across the Sahel are going to make their way all the way down to the water, even if they get there, it's one of those, how are they going to hold it? it There's just going to be a lot of like antibodies, natural yeah. antibodies in the system. Um, so I don't actually see, like, maybe, no, I think, that's fine. I, that's I, I actually think question. it's, mm -hmm. I think it's more of, um, I don't know how far these extremists are wanting to, to come down. I have no insight into the expansive interests of, of, uh, of extremists, but I would imagine that holding the territory that they have, finding kindred spirits in, in sort of adjacent communities, regardless of international borders, is probably where their head is at now. Like yeah. world domination, maybe is part of it. But but I think maybe they're they're coastal, looking at, at coastal domination. Coastal domination. <laughs> yeah, just the littoral domination. <laughs> Great. Well, I will remind everyone online to please uh, weigh in with any questions and comments. But I'm going to commandeer the mic because. I can. Um, I have a question too. If you oh, want excellent. To All right. Well, my yeah. first question for, for your tea party over there is, um, no. you know, we've been hearing so much about the Global Fragility Act. I know, Errol, you touched on it as well. And I'm struck by this conversation and the fact that the Global Fragility Act is indeed only focused on one region and that the rest are mm. nation states. Um, and yet you gave an example of one of the nation states that's also a, a country, Mozambique, um, where there are these cross-border conflict issues. And so my question for you all, and, and I think some of you had seats at the table as this was, was being developed, is were there conversations about considering um, more regional approaches um, to rolling out the, the policy? Um, and if not, is that something um, that we in the, the peace building work, the research, the implementation that we do, should be keeping a close eye on and considering, um, given all of the examples and evidence you've shared today? I'm going to hand that to BZ. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> And I will say, yeah. I did not come up with this question before. <laughs> you. So I am inserting myself in the in the um the it's coffee. A great question. Uh, it's a great question. Particularly your your Karamoja uh, sort of example of the mineral mineral extraction type of more needs to be done knowing that that's a place. I feel like that's a that sort of dovetails to some degree and mm -hmm. a, a more appropriate response could be building from policy into actually a pragmatic response, but yeah, and I admittedly, um, and I don't know if, Errol, you did have a seat at that table. It was a, an exclusive table. If we had Liz Hume here, <laughs> she could she could espouse on exactly how these countries were selected. Um, I think there was, though, if I had to, to guess, I think there was, I know there were various criteria that were used, which is one where you're seeing um, uh, climate change as one of the main drivers of conflict. Mm -hmm. Others, violent extremism. Others, um, 
I think there was a, a gender component in there. So the selection of countries that sort of they, they created kind of a funnel and then what came out of it, some of them they knew were intractable, very long standing conflicts like Libya um, and others where you see you saw conflict, but it was less in the news. Um, like the Mozambiques that now are starting to really bubble up and people are like, oh, of course, Mozambique, you know, violent extremist spillover. We've had violent extremist spillover in other areas, but maybe they're trying, that's more of the prevention country versus Libya, which is more of the longstanding, is there anything we can do to reverse the trend? You know, if they were picking out, yeah. if they were picking out that you probably had a seat at the table, but if they if no, they, but I heard all the gossip. <laughs> <laughs> but if they were, I I do wonder if you know, one to two years from now, would they be picking Sudan as a country? Mm -hmm. Right, you're seeing so many tensions and pressure points there. Um, it had has been long standing, but you know whether or not they're going to move to more of a regional approach or stay, I I. I'm hopeful that there will be a more regional approach as we think about prevention, because these borders are so arbitrary and are um, these historical legacies that at this point in time, there is no, no division between those communities. And I think we need to think more regionally oriented rather than country, but this to Kito's earlier point is where our funding structures are so antiquated. Mm -hmm. You have a very hard time getting people to not focus on countries and focus on region. And we have not created the architecture in the US government funding mechanisms to get regionally. I think GFA is one of the first ones that I can think of where we're doing more of a regional approach on funding, but usually it's missions receive the funding, da 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 da. But anyway. I, I would love Pia's thoughts on on funding. I'll comment a little bit on the on the regional versus country, um, and I will not. God bless you. Sorry. I will not say whether I was at the table or not. I wasn't really. Uh, I staffed Liz for a couple of events. Let's just say that. Um, but I think so. Those of us who are out on the outside have this really annoying tendency, where whatever it is. I'm I'm saying us being this side of the table, think tank to not not you guys, you you you're fabulous. Um, we have this annoying tendency of saying, oh yeah, it needs to be more regional because there's all these cross border issues. It becomes more regional, and then we're like, oh, but every country is unique and distinct, and we need bespoke strategies. So like the the recommendations write themselves depending on whatever they come up. So I, I actually think that let's pause and give our U.S. government friends credit where credit is due Absolutely. in that they did a little bit of both. Um, I think that this, uh, not all of the places could have been regional. I think the easy way out for them would have been to pick five countries. Right. Because you have one mission, you have one funding source, it's just cleaner, it's easier. But I think that those of us who have been yelling about, we need more regional strategies because cross-border, et cetera, um, I think they heard that, and they heard that from Ghanaians and and Tbilisi and and Venezuelans, and and so I think that they they said, look, let's we need to figure out a subregion here. This one seems to be prevention, trying to prevent spillover. Um, it's you know you've got uh, institutions that you can work with. The problem in a place like Haiti and Libya, two other priority countries, is it's pure stabilization. You have yeah. very few sort of formal counterparts that you can work with. Well, that's not the case in Ghana. There's a national peace architecture in Ghana, national peace councils, regional peace councils, local peace councils. You've got a lot of work that you can do in, in places like that. They're going to be different in Togo. They're going to be different in Cote d'Ivoire. But what's that connective tissue how does climate impact? Well, I think they're thinking about this. Um, I think the question becomes, how do you then make that funding match your recognition that some of these are regional issues? And to crack that nut, I'll turn to my friend. Yeah. Right, of course, it's very yeah. simple. Super <laughs> yeah, easy. No. And 240 characters or less. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. I mean, I think this is the, we all are grappling with the same issue. I'm, I'm imagining the donor conversations are similar to what we're talking about. They're there, they're on the ground. They see these in the same kind of way. Um, you, you know, 
to some degree, it's almost around there being even just better communication internally. Every, I mean, the root of everything is communication, it seems, right? Just in terms of there, there will be a number of different actors on the ground whenever these crises are there, particularly when they're protracted. We know what the different players are. Um, but I think when you look at, I mean, Turkey was just such a stark example because it's a stable country with resources, with a disaster preparedness background. I mean, earthquake prone in Turkey, right? I mean, right. there's there's a lot of things that are already there. But even in that kind of circumstance, we saw similar types of issues in terms of huge flood of resources that were able to come in through existing mechanisms into highly volatile Syria and less so uh, when it came to, to Turkey in that circumstance. So mm. I imagine it is around the the need for that. Um, we're not, it's not going to be a whole hog revision. I couldn't imagine it being, I mean, there's just the antiquated infrastructure is just so entrenched. I mean, it's, yeah, so let's say even in some, it's been there long enough to even be crumbling, right? I mean, it's just really, truly sort of that entrenchment. But I think that is, if, if the center point is not just the geopolitical impact, though, of course, that is important, but it's also that center point of local support communities at the center. I mean, it, it, it reminds me well of how there was such the push early, early on around, you know, there's there's no, like, no fly zones, right? No fly zones for disease spread. I mean, it's mm. kind, of, kind of a ridiculous thing to even talk about, right? <laughs> I've heard that. that you is... know? And it's just one of those similar in these kinds of circumstances where it's, you know, there's there's a lot that we can and should be doing with the resources that we have. And just to be able to have a better coordinated yeah. discussion about it internally within the structures that are there, because from the outside, we can say what it is that we want, but it has to be from the inside where there's that willingness to say, let's reach across and to create something unique. And we have seen it, I would say. There's yeah. enough examples out there where it is that willingness around uh, unique circumstances, like they're critical ones, like I would say Turkey was one. Mm -hmm. We do we do have a question oh. from um, participants online, and I do think Pia, you touched on this a bit, but I will offer um, I will offer it up in case folks have any other ideas. So um, he is asking. Um, we talked a good deal about the need for flexible funding and the current constraints of earmarked funding that is nation state focused. With that in mind. How specifically might multilateral and bilateral donors better re-envision funding mechanisms to more effectively target and prevent cross-border conflicts? Mm. Recommendations? Back over to you all. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first stab at this. I think, first of all, on the bilateral side from a U.S. government perspective, an absolutely critical player that we haven't talked about yet is Congress. And I think part of the GFA process was getting Congress on board with this uh, idea that there are cross-border issues and, and, and sort of the regional focus. I'm not to say that everybody in Congress is now fully bought into the regional nature uh, of, or the regional sort of necessity for some funding mechanisms, but I could see this as a launch pad to have some conversations with Congress. Um, I think this, you know, Pia made a really fabulous point among many earlier when you said it's all really about coordination and, and, and communication. And, and I think that's, I don't necessarily see the solution here as we're all going to have one beautiful pot of money and there's going to be like efficient resource allocation to exactly where it's needed. And enough money. And right. enough. And the Germans and the Americans are going to be completely aligned behind all the things that like, and then we woke up, right? That's not that's not actually how this is going to work. But you could have better coordination between, okay, the bank wants to do a big infrastructure project in this place. How is that, uh, you know, let's do the conflict analysis to make sure it's not making things worse. Sure. But let's also talk to the OTI implementers in, in the place. Let's talk to um, some of those local uh, conflict prevention, CSOs, peace building organizations, and see if there are ways that we can connect the funding, even cross-border funding, right. um, and, and more align it to the needs of a geographic area that makes sense regardless of borders. And I think that's a, like one of the things that we have to overcome is there there are sometimes active disincentives in, in the various systems for people to do that. Like mm -hmm. you you are, if I'm sort of a world banker or you know a, a loan officer, or a grants officer in a particular country, like I am judged based on what I do in that country. So how do we make incentives so that that person in Togo 
actually sees benefit and is incentivized to talk to that person in Ghana or that person in Tanzania talking to the Mozambican to make sure that on both sides of the border, sure, you've got funding that's earmarked for those countries, but like make sure they're slightly more coordinated to acknowledge this sort of cross-border reality. No, well said. I mean, maybe to pull on that, the end of that thread a little bit more too, I think where the, you know, the current um, flavor of localization inspections that we're having mm -hmm. now can actually contribute positively in that way, amplifying those voices at mission level amongst themselves, among different organizations, different local um, organizations that are there to really just reinforce the point that it is at the community level and the borders are, you know, mythical or non, you know, not really as much of an issue uh, when it comes to the the needs that are there and also the opportunities that are there. So ideally, those two conversations will help to amplify uh, what I think needs to be more of a robust conversation about the age old structures not necessarily helping too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I am going to take a page from Liz Hume's book and ask you all one more question. Um, so we are at PeaceCon in five years from now. In a couple of sentences, what, what might panels be talking about, um, about improved cross-border responses? What, what would you hope to see as, as people who research and implement programs who, um, you know, who are who have faced these issues, where would you envision us being in five years in an ideal world from now? And I once again did not prime them for this question. So please take take a minute. Um I, I took the last one first. So I, I'm uh... I can grab I can grab that one perhaps first. Um we have been talking about a lot of these things, I would say, and a lot of the different proposed solutions be great to actually have the evidence backing up all of the ideas that we had mm -hmm. talked about and what we've actually had the resources to try um, to be able to show what had worked and not worked in that, um, in that five year span between now and then. More evidence. Yeah, more, I mean, more evidence. I feel like we've been calling for that for years and we're now actually starting to see that with different frameworks and methodologies and quasi-experimental evaluations and that kind of thing to, to measure what is working. Um, gosh, if I had my little silver, or not a so crystal ball, um, and was thinking about what do we want to see with um, sort of how do we mitigate these cross-border conflicts, is really sticking to and listening to the communities about what they need. Uh, and not and and breaking some of the of the the funding structures that are inhibiting us from being able to do the work that we need to do, and the policies like having much more coordinated policy conversations. I think you're starting to see that with GFA in terms of the three Ds, et cetera. Um, but I think we also need to be doing it on a multilateral basis as well. Do are there are the I'm not sitting at those tables, but are there tables where we're seeing you know. FCDO and USAID and DFAT and all of the other funding sitting around saying, this is our prioritization. What's yours? What's yours? Oh, okay. We have similar interests. Let's come together and figure out you want to do this. I want to do that. When you lump it together, it builds up this, this mm -hmm. it creates a much better, more cohesive way in which to mitigate. I just don't think we do enough communication, coordination, and I think we need to break some of the archaic structures around how we resolve these intractable issues and um, combine with the evidence, because we'll have the evidence mm -hmm. to make that case. Can I wish you had a, a magic wand? That that's like that would be a really beautiful world. I wish um, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> and if I had one, I magic would give wand. it to you. And a crystal ball. Uh, and a crystal ball. Um, I th I think on the so a couple of things, one that I think built on what you both said about the evidence, I, I think that we hopefully will have a better way of telling the story of prevention. It's, it's all of our monitoring and evaluation stuff. It tends to be sort of backwards looking. How do we tell the story of something that didn't happen? Right. Yeah. Proving the counterfactual. Proving yeah. the counterfactual is very hard. Um, and I, and I think that this is part of this strategy to prevent conflict and promote stability is, is trying to pilot and figure out how we do that. I'm not smart enough to know exactly how, but in five years, hopefully people who are smart enough have figured out a way. And this PeaceCon this year has been, been a lot of really cool sessions about like 
new fancy technocratic ways of generating and utilizing evidence. And, and so I let's bring some of that energy in five years to this telling the story of prevention. I think that my my since you talked about that one, I, I the other one is again relating to the GFA and the strategy to prevent conflict and, and promote civility is is their 10-year strategies. In 10 years, are we going to stabilize and build peace in Haiti and Libya? I hope so, probably not. But what we can do, and I think what I would like to see even in the next five years is the US government doing things slightly differently. Um, you've got the different 3D stakeholders, uh, that are talking regularly and their um, their teams are talking. There's an interagency standing committee. Yes, it's taken a long time to get off the ground, but but this is a new way of doing things. I think those that watch this space, I'm getting really wonky DC here. I'm sorry to all the like, you know, cool international peace builders here, but like wonky DC is where I see in five years, we will have been, we will hopefully be doing business a little bit differently and better. It's with coordination, it's with aligning funding and priorities and strategies and plans. Um, I, I think that's where I would love for maybe not a plenary, but maybe a, a side panel in five years from now on AFP to talk about just the wonky bureaucratic changes that have been made and how that actually sets us up for success in the next five years of the GFA implementation and maybe the next 15 years and 20 years, because I think people also forget that the Global Fragility Act was designed to be piloted in certain places, not piloted, tested, or whatever the, the term is. But really, this is about changing the way that the US government approaches conflict prevention, which is not something we've done particularly well over the years. And, and so changing those bureaucratic mechanisms, coordination, collaboration, et cetera, um, sounds super boring, and I'm sorry for putting the whole audience to sleep on this note, but I, I think that there that sets us up for even greater success into the future. I, I, I want to throw something. We have a, a minute or two, right? We have okay. nine minutes. Okay. Um, and I definitely didn't prep them for this because this just popped into my head, but um, dare I ask, do we think that there is a role for artificial intelligence mm. in terms of starting to think about conflict prevention, right? What is it, we talk about the data, we talk about the evidence, but now it's about the technologies and what technologies can be leveraged in five years. What are we gonna say, oh, you know, if we only knew 10 years ago when the GFA, was, we were knocking on the door and we were doing all this work on that, but you're gonna have the, we're gonna have new technologies emerging and I think that are gonna blow our mind and Congress's mind and all mm -hmm. the other minds around the table. But do we think there's a role there for AI? Personal, I mean, I guess they're all personal opinions, right? Um, absolutely, I think we're missing an opportunity if we don't actually uh, sort of take that hold by the horns. So something I just wrote, which I feel like we're in the same vibe now, in our tea, tea fire room, whatever it is, um, <laughs> is that- um, Don't call it a tea party. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. <laughs> is that, I mean, what we're really talking about it, what are the, what are the sort of, what are the peace futures, right? That we're talking yeah. about here? What's this, what's yeah. this future what today? What is the, what does this peace look like, right? In five years and 10 years. And, you know, I think doing things differently, using our arcane, but can be modified systems. You, you, there's only so much I think you can do to just improve communication and coordination. Structures are entrenched. They're there for a reason. You will have that legacy, the cultural nuances of them until the end of time. That's the way things are oftentimes, right? So you can modify to some degree, but it is bringing in newer kinds of actors, I would say, with, you know, more in the financial inclusion space. We had a conversation, I don't think it was here as much, but, you know, more so about international financial institutions, you know, doing business differently, right? Mm -hmm. So looking at game-changing tech, that was something that I put down as well. I'm looking at philanthropic actors and those that are sort of evolving into that space more so now, not your traditional, but more of your non-traditional perhaps. Um, but when I look at AI as well, I mean, that's, if you just, just the amount of information coming that you're able to do to be able to get a need, basic needs assessment, rudimentary types of things in an hour that would have taken literally 
a, you know, two, two years of study in the library where I went to grad school to sort of get the base understanding for what needs to go into an argument I'm making in a dissertation. My gosh, I mean, it's really kind of unbelievable, but just that information flow that's there. So I don't think um, we should underestimate really what it what it could um, offer us when it comes to the information sharing piece and very clearly showing we sort of say where we think that the resources are going oftentimes, but it's very opaque. Okay, it's hard to really see how much, how, what were the resources that went into that. We're saying we didn't actually show the impact that we expected, but did we actually contribute substantial enough resources to make an impact? Right. Or are we extrapolating from a tiny little case study, which we all love to do? <laughs> One little tiny thing is extrapolated so much. I, yeah, I really think that there's something to be said for, for pulling that thread a little more, maybe. Can I say something topic. on that, if that's okay? And I'm sorry for stepping in. I run AFP's digital peace building community of practice. Oh, so that's oh, that question was for you, that's yes. you. Yes, there you go. Well, so I totally agree with what you're saying. And actually, tomorrow there will be a session specifically on generative AI and virtual reality and its use in peace building here in O'Connor at 2.15. Well, I believe. will be there. So, and <laughs> yes, it's going to be great. Um, you and DPPA will be there, but... You thought you were all innovative in that. Yeah. <laughs> They've got a panel on an RV plant. <laughs> All that being said, I these people who design these AI products, these tools, they care about disrupting the system as much as possible, which is great. Once that happens, the genie is out of the bottle. You can't really go back. Disrupting the system is not always good. Um, I think it's really important in the next five years that the peace building community is involved with the design and creation yeah. of best practices and getting frameworks yeah, for these dangerous. tools because yeah. exactly. if an AI chatbot hallucinates, which is where it just makes up completely false information um, about something that has to do with like the stake of a person's life, and people are saying, oh, but it's saving us so much time. It's like, well, are this are the benefits outweighing the costs of, you know, you're outsourcing a lot of this critical thinking, but it's not even doing it right. And we're just kind of putting blind trust because, you know, AI is also going to make it easier to make troll farms, to democratize the production of disinformation, to even create low code for like hacking into servers. So I think that we need to make sure that the tech companies are we either work alongside them as co-creators or yeah. we, you know, reject, reject and challenge them to say, listen, you're going, you're creating technology that's completely going to change how we live. So you have to make sure you do it in a way that promotes cohesion. So I am, I personally am more fearful of AI <laughs> than supportive. I think, I think it's a flexible moment. Like the iron is hot and the metal is, is bendable or whatever. I don't know what the analogy is, but we need to be, to be in the conversation. In the right way. Yes, yes, yes. Let, let me take the flip side of that. I, I think what I'm about to say, which is more on the potential side, probably will coexist in that darker world that, that you mentioned. Also, when you said AI, I was uh, my last use of chat GBT over the weekend was to design a scavenger hunt for a six-year-old birthday uh, <laughs> mermaid themed party. Um, it's really good for idea to write. Really, really good, actually. I was like, eight-step mermaid six-year-old party. So <laughs> but I think as it relates to this conversation, um, I, I published something in Politico earlier this year uh, on, we basically, I partnered with a AI nerd friend of mine who does sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. And he, he scrapes the internet, open source data. And we basically tried to tell a story that Vladimir Putin doesn't want told, which is that his propaganda is not as useful on his mm -hmm. citizens as he thinks it is, mm -hmm. uh, especially outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. I'll leave you to, to the, the sort of nitty gritty details to, the, to that article. But the work that I was doing with him made me think that in this sort of fragility stabilization space one of the big things that i've always thought about was this is about trust yeah. trust between citizens and their institutions and when there is no trust or when that breaks down who's this is the role of non-state actors can build that trust etc so why can't we use those same tools to define and approximate trust hmm. um you you're going to be asking the ai machine the ai monster different questions and asking them to, to comb different parts of the internet and different geographic areas and, and sort of looking for different keywords, but you probably could approximate trust. Uh, you'd have to define it, you'd have to iterate on that, but, but I think that this is actually a really cool opportunity for, under, for us to understand those 
ties that bond and thus be able to understand the problem set in a more nuanced, granular way. Really interesting. I'm, I'm going to come in. We have one minute left. And I, I did just want to share um, a comment from someone in the chat on this topic, which is, I think, a really relevant one. But AI is essentially, it's written by humans. And so this person made a point that it is rife with racism, imperialism, and sexism. And it's because it's built on those very systems. And um, there's apparently a, a Time article about the ethics hmm. of how GBT exploited Kenyan workers to reduce hmm. child, sec uh, child sexual abuse content. And so hmm. I think this is a very relevant point for we as peace builders and, and researchers in this space to keep in mind as we want to consider the tools um, at our disposal. Um, but with that, with a minute left, um, I think I'm going to thank you all for inviting us to, I will not call it a tea party this time, to your <laughs> fireside um, tea, uh, tea chat. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you on the line um, for dealing with some of our, our initial AV issues. I know we did not get to all of your questions. They warmed up. Um, team at, at the end, but thank you all so, so much um, and enjoy the rest of the panels today. Yay, thank thanks. you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.